You're listening to Neo Cash Radio, where we discuss the future of money today. In the studio with you, it's JJ. And Darren. And Randy. And Ethereum Rules the World, a discussion about the true cost of Bitcoin transactions, U.S. debt reckoning, and Pedro joins us in studio. All this and more on episode 194 here on Wednesday, February 15th, 2017. Darren? In the traditional markets, we have gold down to $1,234. Uh, silver's up to $17.95. Oil is up to $53 even, and the Dow Jones is up to 20,611 points. Uh, the 30-year Treasury yield went up uh, to uh, to 3.08. The euro is down slightly to a, buying a $1.06. Uh, the Chinese yuan will buy you uh, 15 cents, and the British pound buys $1.25. Excellent. Uh, Randy, you want to give us the crypto markets? Sure. Uh, Bitcoin's down to 1,009. It's been bouncing around 1,000 bucks for a couple days now. Uh, Litecoin down to 381. Zcash down to 3375. Dash continues to climb. It's at $19.31. Ethereum rises to 13 bucks. Monero is up to 1366. Augur's rep tokens are up to 490. And one Doge. Darren is one doge. Oh, that's wow. Just yeah. a reminder, you can tune into Neocash Radio every Wednesday night. Don't want to miss out on a single moment of awesome Neocash content, including special episodes and bonus interviews. Subscribe to our podcast on Google Play Music, iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, YouTube, Podcast Addict, Library, and more. Thanks for joining us, Pedro. Once again, you're with us in studio. It's always a pleasure. Thank you for having me on, guys. Excellent. Well, our first story, uh, starting with you know the big, I guess the big story, nineteen trillion is that is that the the number yeah, now? Yeah, nineteen trillion, and uh, the the uh, very improbable happened this last month. The uh, am- amount of the national debt went down in January. Wow. Yeah. What? Wh- wh- why? Is there a reason? I, I, I have no idea. Maybe they didn't spend as much money that month. I, I don't know. Well, anyway, uh, we've got a story here. There's a reckoning with the incomprehensible U.S. Uh, debt. The federal government is running out of lenders. Well, we've been talking about this for a while on Neocash Radio. And, of course, the lender of last resort is the Federal Reserve. Right. But what else do we have with this story here? So this article claims that there's basically four classes or groups of lenders. Uh, one is uh, uh, local uh, just citizens uh, loaning money. Anytime that bu- somebody buys a bond, uh, a federal bond, they, they do this. Uh, all, another group is banks, and another group is foreign governments. And uh, this this article here at the InsideSources.com is uh, is uh, claiming that the uh, that federal governments are uh, basically uh, suspending their buying of debt, and and of course that's not all of them, but. Uh, uh, some have been selling uh, U.S. debt, and uh, the the people in that live in the U.S. Uh, they they have uh, limited means. We're still kind of in a recession, so they they're not buying the debt. And banks banks aren't buying the debt as much, and uh, there's uh, certainly some reasons for that. One is the uh, ever increasing federal funds rate uh, that where banks can park their money. And earn some interest on it without uh, resorting to treasuries. Uh, so, so uh, that would leave the uh, the lender of last resort, the Federal Reserve, uh, to basically just buy all the U.S. debt if uh, interest rates are to remain at any uh, any reasonable amount or what where we see them today. Wow. So, well, I mean, that's not really a surprise. We we've been talking about that, but I mean. What's what does that really mean though? What what if the Federal Reserve is buying basically all the government bonds, Darren? Well, when the Federal Reserve buys bonds, they basically uh, just uh, with a stroke of a pen create the money or, or or wish it into existence. And so, when something like that happens, uh, it can severely devalue the value of the currency. Devalue the currency. So, like when I when I uh, went to work today and did some made some sequel and and came up with some reports for some, some people uh there was value that i traded in in exchange for the money that i received so i i'm backing the value of those dollars with my labor but if if uh if i was able just to sit here and wish some money into existence then the the value of that money would certainly be uh very limited and uh, once I spend that money, it bas- basically that valueless money gets distributed throughout the whole economy and, and brings down the value of all 
all the rest the uh, rest of the money. So like price inflation, basically. Yeah, yeah. So is, is what the consumer sees. Right. Well, um, and this is what we're seeing at the European Central Bank, right? I mean, they're, they've been buying a, a tremendous amount of government and corporate bonds right. over the past couple of years. And we've re- recently covered the fact that they're going to be continuing that uh, so-called economic stimulus program. But yes, it's devaluing currency. Right. So um, there, there's no mention of QE4 in this type of... Uh, in this article, but uh, th- that might be uh, something to keep on the lookout for if uh, if these predictions are true. I also think there's there's uh, the, the 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 economy or the people that are trying to steer the economy are in a much more difficult place now because they already have the federal funds rate up to seventy or point seven five percent of one percent, and uh, that that could cause some problems in the future because basically. They're running out of options. Of course, you could lower the funds rate, but then that would uh, re- release a lot of money into the uh, economy because banks would uh, basically pull their money out. Or uh, And they could also raise the rates. But if they raise the rates, we've seen the uh, short-term treasuries, which we don't report on every month, but the, the interest rate of the short-term treasuries have been trailing the uh, federal funds rate by about a quarter of a percent. So... Um, if they raise the uh, federal funds rate, it's it's likely that the short term interest rate will go up too, which will just raise the cost of of the to the government uh, to the federal government of all the lending that's done. Now, didn't uh, federal chairman Yellen um, insinuate that this week that the Fed might need to start considering raising rates? Yeah, yeah. I mean, they're 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 kind of in a rock and a hard place. I mean, if they raise rates, they'll they'll certainly have issues uh, that could slow down the economy. I don't know. If they think tr- having Trump in there is going to actually stimulate the economy enough to justify uh, uh, putting the brakes on the economy. Well, I mean, bit. if you look at uh, since Trump has taken office, the the record set by the, the Dow Jones mm-hmm. indicator, right? I mean, that's that's one, I guess it's indicator. That doesn't right. necessarily mean that the economy is, you know, all of a sudden perfect and fixed and everything like that. It just means that the stock market is bullish, really. Right. It, it, it's uh, hopeful that... Uh, uh, changes of uh, the, the administration, not that uh, anybody would might, may or may not support them, but uh, um, just it's it's saying that the markets are are thinking that it, it could actually have a positive impact on business and uh, profits. Well, our next companies. story actually focuses on the Federal Reserve as well, and and Chair Janet Yellen uh, defends the Fed uh, Fed's independence. Now, the Fed is a privately owned bank. Mm-hmm. That's uh, working in conjunction with the treasury. In fact, the Fed loans the treasury the money that gets circulated into the economy by the treasury, right? Right. So, uh, what what uh, what's what, what's with this story here? Well, basically, <clears throat> excuse me. In a meeting uh, that kind of lasted a little over four hours, uh, GOP lawmakers were reported reportedly uh, challenging Janet Yellen, the Federal Reserve Chair, uh, her handling of the economy and her leadership in implementing the 2010 Dodd Frank Act, which is uh, something that President Dump- Trump uh, <laughs> has vowed to overhaul. Uh, one of the congressmen, House Financial Services Chairman Jeb Hensarling from Texas, uh, asked Yellen or told Yellen, after eight years, there is zero evidence that zero interest rates and a bloated Fed balance sheet lead to a healthy economy. Clearly, Americans have a newfound expectation that our economy will grow healthier with different policies coming out of Washington. Uh, So she was pressed and asked when the Fed would begin reducing the size of its uh, $4 trillion plus balance sheet. And um, she was rather nebulous, saying that the uh, Fed officials felt that holding uh, their bond holdings uh, and not reducing them. They didn't want to reduce them until their benchmark rate was raised to a, quote, more normal level. So um, we just talked about a couple weeks ago, the the benchmark rate being raised actually in episode 186. It was raised to uh, 05 to 0.75%. Um, but yeah, Trump has been quite vocal about the fact that it's been kept uh, what he calls artificially low for many years since the uh, the big explosion in 2008 with, you know, the big financial crash. Um well, as Trump, as Trump is a businessman, you know, and and we've seen sort of his uh, his persona as a businessman right. in the Celebrity Apprentice and, and shows like that. But he 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 just near, needs to ask Yellen. Well, you've lost so much of the value. The Federal Reserve has lost so much of the value since it started of the U.S. dollar. You know, the whole job of it to protect the dollar, and it's lost what over ninety five percent of the value. I'm sure at this point since 1913, since the Federal you know, Reserve was he, started. He's he's just like like one you know quip away from saying you're fired, 
and nationalizing it, which I don't know if he could, and I don't know what ramifications that would that would uh, entail, but that would shake things up, certainly. Oh, well, it certainly would. Um, are, well, are, we, we are we sure that Trump understands how I've, inflation is caused by printing too many dollars? I mean, as, as, as a businessman, he was a bit insulated in, in the sense of he only was concerned with interest rates for, you know, starting uh, more construction and expanding his, his business. But does he understand that, you know, continued deficits is, is going to drive down the value of the dollar into a potential hyperinflation? As mu- much as I don't like the current method of how this all is done, I think nationalizing the Federal Reserve would be worse. Okay. <laughs> I, I'm, I, I, I'm not, to, uh, not, I don't disagree. Uh, I think I'm nationalizing most anything is probably a bad thing. Um, I, but I, I really think that the current way it's done is horrible, but uh, I'm pretty sure if you just had one entity kind of overseeing the whole thing, that would be Well, here's, here's the thing. I mean, can the Federal Reserve go bankrupt? I mean, no. I, I mean, mean, if they can just print money out of thin air and they have, right now they have the $4 trillion balance sheet, right? Right, right. And then you, you, what they have on their plus side is the what's held in reserve. So we, we just talked about that 0.75%. And there's, what, $2.4 trillion on reserve right now or something right. to that yeah, effect. And it's, it's been decreasing lately. But, uh, yeah, about two-something trillion. So, like, it, it looks to me like they're, they're in the negative if, if, we, you know, if we sum things across. Well, but I don't know what assets they're holding. Well, I, I believe it's $4 trillion net. Uh, they uh, during QE one, QE two, QE three, they made money. They just created money and bought treasuries with that, and they also bought mortgage backed securities. And so, when people talk about the balance sheet of the uh, Federal Reserve, they mean those assets that were bought outright, and uh, the Federal Reserve owns those assets. So, and it's not talking about the two point something trillion that the banks have deposited that they'll get back eventually. That's not considered an asset. Uh, on the balance sheet, from my understanding, at least. Well, it's it's certainly a topic we could probably spend hours talking about, but there's so much more we need to talk about. And in fact, we need to talk about the future of money, not the past of money. <laughs> well, and it's it's not, it's not going to go away either. I mean, no. Trump has been very vocal about Yellen. He's, he said she should be ashamed of herself before, and we've talked a bit, uh, episode 183, we talked a lot about how Trump was going to be pretty uh, substantial with the Federal Reserve appointments. He's got, I think, three or four seats that he's going to be able to uh, change in his next uh, in his first but, and hopefully only term. <laughs> uh, yeah, but from what I what my, my understanding is that the Fed gives him a a choice, uh, like a, a draft pick roster of choices, and he has to choose from those. So like it's already hand selected, mm. and, and then which which head of the hydro he chooses really doesn't matter. Right. But we'll see if he let's let's. I mean, if he goes outside that list and he picks someone else, what happens then? That's. I mean, I'm just sort of like. Uh, you know, sort of like a mystery. It's a little a bit of an intrigue, perhaps. But well, I definitely recommend if anyone wants to go back and listen to episode uh, 183. We talk quite a bit about debt and the problems with it, and with quantitative easing, and just how debt is enslavement of future generations. And uh, yeah, that the problems of printing money out of nowhere. But yes, to the future of money, JJ. Excellent. Let's we've, go. We've got a story here from Eric Voorhees. Uh, he talks about the true cost of Bitcoin transactions. And I listened to last week's show while I was on vacation, and a lot of discussion was had about the rising fees and the confirmation times and things like that. And so, so this this story sort of, I guess, dovetails with that rather nicely. And in this article, Eric talks about how most people understand the cost of Bitcoin to be the miner's fee and that, that simple ad- additional fee that they tack onto their transaction. Well, he actually expands the cost of Bitcoin transactions to be considered. Now, obviously, this is for consideration, but he, he, he breaks it down as such. Basically, the cost is equal to the fee plus the time taken to determine the fee plus the risk of uncertainty. And so basically what he's talking about is um, the not everybody can find the fee and, and maximize uh, that, that fee and, and figure out, okay, based on the value I'm sending and the amount of time I'm willing to wait for this transaction to occur, you know, there, there's a little bit of your time that's wasted. And then there's the risk of uncertainty. And I think what this kind of gets down to is the... Um, the uncertainty of of how long do I need this? Like, how long can I wait for this transaction to confirm? Right. So, like, uh, okay. So, like, if I'm going to a coffee shop and I'm buying a coffee, now for for the person, the, the vendor, 
They want a very little low risk of, of uncertainty. They want, they want that confirmation to happen as soon as possible because you're going to be walking out of that coffee shop in five minutes, 10 minutes, you know, maybe even less, and they might never see you again. Now, that doesn't mean that it won't ever get confirmed, right? It just means that they have bills to pay. They might have a, a very limited cash flow, and every dollar counts. Um, so he's breaking down the, he's, he's sort of expanding the idea of what a Bitcoin transaction costs to, to be more of a human action consideration. And there are some other factors, I, I suppose to say. But um, let me just read a, a slight bit here uh, for, for how he explains it. And then we'll, we'll have the, the rest of it on the blog. You can link, we'll have a link to it and you can read it for yourself. Uh, I'm just going to read a little bit here. Quote, those people who are using Bitcoin today pay more than a miner's fee. They pay in time and uncertainty or risk. As blocks are full, users often need to change the fee they add to their transaction before or after they send it. Some wallets do an okay job of this, but most don't. And if you vilify a wallet's creators, realize that smart fee policy is nowhere near a science yet and changes all the time. So in, in addition to the miner's fee, the, the user currently has to spend time to determine that it ought to be that amount in the first place. A highly skilled Bitcoin, Bitcoiner can f- figure out the appropriate fee in a minute, but if Bitcoin can't be a platform for only highly skilled Bitcoiners. If that, if that is the target market, then the project is doomed. That's so, right. So I think that's where you need to have uh, maybe wallets that can determine that fee better. Because he's right. You need to take this away from the average person. They want to be able to go buy their product, pay for it in Bitcoin, and the vendor they're getting it from you know, knows that that transaction's going through. So right now, without scaling, to me, Bitcoin is starting to look like a platform where you keep significant money not a cup of coffee money to spend. Right. Yeah, and, and he does, in his article, he does differentiate between microtransactions and, uh, and and I think in his article, he's thinking microtransactions are like less than a dollar or, you know, like two, $3, for example. If you're going to pay a dollar in miner's fee to send $3 along, then Bitcoin is not right for you. It's not right for that cup of coffee, but no. it might be right to move, you know, $50,000 around. Sure. So, um. So it's an interesting article, and, and, and you know, I like, I like the philosophy of, of looking at Bitcoin in a, in a greater sense, and, you know, it's, I think it's good exercise. But uh, let's move on to talk about more Bitcoin news here. Two of China's biggest Bitcoin exchanges halt Bitcoin withdrawals for one month. Citing the need for upgrades to combat, combat money laundering, exchange, pyramid schemes, and other illegal activities, Chinese Bitcoin exchanges OKCoin and Hubi have put a halt to Bitcoin and Litecoin withdrawals. Now, BTCC has a 72-hour delay for the withdrawals. The news, the reason for this is because they need to upgrade in order to better protect themselves against these illegal activities. Now, the move comes not long after a surprise inspection from the People's Bank of China. The central bank has also issued a very stern warning to domestic exchanges and to startups that if they don't toe the line, they will be shuttered. This is not good news coming out of China when it comes to Bitcoin. And the amount of power and fluidity that happens and velocity of Bitcoin that happens in China is significant. Right. So this is, this is actually, this is not good at all. I mean, if no one can withdraw, now, now mind you, for OKCoin, this is only affecting the CN portal. So the OKCoin.CN portal. Um, but in so China, only users in China or yes, using the Chinese portal. Exactly. Okay. So... This is this is not if if you can't take your money out of the exchange, you don't own that money. Right. And and basically they're locking up all these users' money into the exchange. Like I would I, I would half heartedly, I guess, I tell anybody that's using those exchanges, do not put any more Bitcoin onto them. Do not put any more money onto them. Now, you can do certain things on these exchanges. There's the uh, the Yuan refresh, there's a couple other things with Yuan that you can do, but you cannot withdraw Bitcoin or Litecoin. Hmm. And so this is this is not good news at all as far as the future of Bitcoin in China. And in contrast, in Japan this week, um, one of the major banks invested almost $2 million into a new Bitcoin exchange, Bitflyer. And uh, some of the news coming out with Japan is because of what happened with Mt. Gox. Bitcoin doesn't have a, a very good reputation in Japan. And um, there are some folks that are trying to change that. And they're trying to see if Japan can start taking on as a bigger uh, Bitcoin exchange. 
market. Wow. We also have another story here uh, about Ether. We're going to move, moving on and talking yeah. about Ethereum here. <laughs> Uh, lots of news about Ethereum, so so hang on to your hats, people. Yes. Uh, this first one, and once again, getting back to the banks, getting involved, uh, Pedro, uh, J.P. Morgan, Santander. I mean, Santander is huge. J.P. Morgan is huge. What's going on there? This is really interesting. It's dubbed uh, uh, Enterprise Ethereum. Uh, it's an it's a founding membership includes uh, tech giants like Microsoft, Red Hat, Cisco. There's J.P. Morgan, British uh, Petroleum. And also a bunch of blockchain startup apps like Block Apps and BrainBot and Consensus. Um, in addition to that, the Ethereum Foundation itself is being involved. And what they're looking to do is to take basically the, the current state of the art of the Ethereum blockchain technology, but apply it in a private, uh, in a private way. So it wouldn't be a public blockchain, but it would be a private blockchain between major companies. Uh, the financial industry is getting uh, involved in this. And... What they like about it is that they can use this to confirm transactions amongst themselves in a, in a much more efficient way than a lot of the legacy platforms that have been around for decades. So uh, this is going to really uh, give some good you know, spotlight on the Ethereum project, uh, and I'm bullish on Ethereum, and as a disclaimer, I own some. So, um, But this is exciting news for the Ethereum project. Yes, I, you know, once again, big names like this, and and as you know, J.P. Morgan and both Santander, they they both have a a, a very storied and perhaps uh, scandalous history. Uh, J.P. Morgan with uh, manipulating silver markets, and Santander has its own debt uh, and balance sheet issues. Uh, I think J.P. Pi has that too. And, but, and maybe that's why they're getting into a blockchain, is so that it keeps them all honest. Yeah. And, and that's that's a that and we'll we'll talk more about how blockchains uh, might be used by more than just banks. But uh, next up, Ethereum founder Vitalik issues an update on the Metropolis update. What's going on with that? Uh, so Valentine's Day was a day they chose for a uh, Valentine's Day edition blog. Um, so Vitalik Buterin, the the founder of uh, one of the founders of Ethereum, took to the Ethereum blog to basically just give a little update to users saying uh, that over the since the beginning of the year, basically the development core, the core development team, research teams have been really busy. Uh, now that they've gotten all those nasty security issues out of the way from last year, um, they are moving forward to uh, getting basically the, the next version of uh, Ethereum up, which is called Metropolis. Um, so in addition to sort of going over some of the collaboration work they've been doing with the Zcash team on uh, zero knowledge proofs and using that kind of uh, anonymous transaction functions over the Ethereum uh, blockchain, uh, Vitalik's been writing some blog posts about that. Uh, he also talks a little bit about uh, proof of stake, that they're trying to solidify uh, the Casper specification, and uh, there's no dates given really, but just uh, saying that things are being worked on. Uh, there's been two core dev meetings. They're working on uh, abstraction, which I guess is uh, something that was brought up uh, in an Ethereum improvement proposal, and they want to come cut the complexity in the system by shifting some foundational rules around security into contracts. Um, so just basically trying to clean up a bit and make things sparkle um where they're working on mist and swarm and they're, they're apparently doing so at a rapid pace but again no real dates are given they're also uh solidity is adding a fully specified way to access the compiler input settings and output lots of these things i don't know what they mean but for people who do we'll of course have the link up to the blog uh, up on our blog <laughs> neocashradio.com and you can see exactly what vitalik is talking about and uh, see what you derive from it but there's a whole lot of a uh, whole lot of things underway and it's pretty incredible that uh things like this are being built yeah yeah, I mean, Ethereum had a little uptick this week. I mean, this is obviously the last story, and this story are good news about the, the future and development and whatnot. And, and it, it's it's almost, you know, we don't speculate about the price of things um, because if there's so many other people that do it, and you're more often than not wrong, right? <laughs> I mean, but Ethereum, it definitely seems that there are a lot of, of new dApps coming out, and, and one I was looking at and just briefly mentioning is Colony.io, and it looks like this really interesting uh, multitasking and, and collaborating sort of uh, platform where you, you can work with other people to get things done and, and, it's, and you get a rating based on your success of doing things. And then it's all like democratic and voting and token based. And, and it's really cool to see this stuff happening and, and all these people getting involved, but we're still not 
having that one like like everybody's using this app right now, right? You mean the killer app? Well, it's not really the killer app. I would just say a useful, a used app. Not yeah. not even it doesn't even have to be killer. I just want something that people are using besides a wallet consistently, right? Yeah. Besides a wallet, and and yet as 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 bullish again as I am about the future of Ethereum. Uh, it's it's like wow, it is taking so long. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. yeah it, it's I, I've been a little uh, disappointed to just just see the the dice rolling games and the card games and poker games and stuff. I mean, it's great that those are out there because it allows you a way to audit the uh, the code and see that it is in fact fair and that there's no real central dealer to you know the, the amount of the rake. Um, all that stuff can be vetted and verified by people. So it's nice to know that there are like gambling systems out there where people know the rules and. Uh, and are not it, limited by the ge- geography. Yeah, exactly. But I would, yeah, I would definitely love to see more more programs start to come out. I mean, I can't imagine this stuff is easy to write. Um, right. So, so I I have to be patient, but it's it's really cool, and I want to start seeing more of it now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, well, talking about Ethereum some more here, and, and in fact, uh, consensus, Dubai, and the city of the future. That's right. This past week, the World Government Summit took place in Dubai and included a new white paper from Ethereum Venture Production Studio, Consensus. The white paper is titled Building the Hyperconnected Future on Blockchains and provides a roadmap for governments to harness the power of blockchains. The Crown Prince of Dubai announced in 2016 that Dubai would become the, quote, first government in the world to execute its, all its transactions using blockchain technology by 2020, unquote. And a... Uh, uh, $100,000 prize was granted to a group called Project Oaken, which has created a smart city prototype device that allows vehicles to automatically pay tolls over the Ethereum blockchain using an IPFS hash. Yeah, and there's a little video that uh, we'll put up on the blog as well. It basically shows the prototype, but there were uh, a couple hundred uh, proposals submitted for this gov hack um, program, just basically trying to show how blockchains can be used. Um, and this one in particular, they used a, a Tesla in the video, f- and they linked it up to the uh, to the car. And basically, this uh, prototype toll bridge they have set up—it's not actually a bridge; it's just a little piece of it's a little computing device they've built. But as the car approaches, it signals you know that it wants to pay a toll and cr- create some kind of handshake, and it's all uh, automatically done. Um, but the really cool thing about it to me um, is that. According to the Project Oaken, this this model greatly reduces the backend infrastructure, um, enables transparent automation behind your payments, and allows for new economic models. So you can actually, um, if these things were being built, you can buy bonds in a toll road as is an option. If you wanted to participate in the building of a road or something like that, you could do that instead of using taxes and you know taking from everybody. You could actually uh, you you could actually be involved in funding a road and uh, things like that. So it's pretty interesting. Um, and it brings me to one more quick little article that I saw today. Uh, Jaguar, or Jaguar, if you're in the UK, uh, car manufacturer and has a new pay-for-gas app that they developed with Shell, oil giant Shell. Uh, unveiled today in the UK a touch, on the touchscreen of several new Jaguar models, there's a new in-car cashless payment app that they're calling an industry first. Uh, it allows drivers to pay for gas using PayPal or Apple Pay. Integration with Android Pay and a rollout to other markets, including the U.S., is slated for later this year. Uh, it'd be really nice if they took crypto. Yeah. Let's well, everyone who owns a Jaguar who wants crypto to pay for gas tell your tell your car manufacturer <laughs> now. Well, in in the and in the the, the previous story at the uh, the World Economic uh, Conference uh, summit, I'm sorry, uh, Elon Musk was actually a speaker there at that conference and a couple other well-known people, but uh, really I think the takeaway I got from that was that there are a lot of uh, highly motivated and, and interested parties that are trying to get in on this, and there was a limited slate that they could uh, accom- uh, accommodate. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, the, the fact that there's more interest than availability tells me that the the value is really high. So, um, but looking at the, jeez, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, the travel, I, I recently traveled, and there was one thing that stuck out to me that kind of comes back to all of this right here. And and part of part of my journey was leaving the airport, and I got on a bus to come back to New Hampshire, and uh, just got a big portion of the journey done on on mass transit, just because it worked out really well. But while we were going down, we were looking for our, our bus uh, waiting area. There's a specific part of the airport. 
They, I saw the signs now say app rides. They, they don't, they don't list Uber and, and Lyft and things like that. But now they're, they're literally just having an area and app rides. And app is now, you know, becoming a big thing mm. for for people to to use all the time. Now airports are modifying their signage and whatnot. I mean, this is the future we're seeing like incrementally happen. It is because it provides competition. So uh, as you mentioned, some airports have specific areas for the app cars and traditional ca- taxis. But, you know, just a few years ago, it was just taxis. That's right. That's right. Oh, and I've been to airports before where I've had to like literally walk to the out outskirts of the airport or go across the street to the nearest hotel and hail a car from there because they would only allow t- cabs to come in. You couldn't use the ride sharing apps inside the perimeter of the airport. You could get dropped off there. You couldn't get picked up there. So yeah, this is definitely an evolution and, and uh, the acceptance, not only the acceptance, but it's like, it, it's like, why, why resist this tide of, of technology, you know? And uh, well, Tesla's certainly talked about uh, being able to rent out your car, you know, have and in cities where there's large enough people, they'll have their own fleet that they operate. But um, there's another company called Mobotic, M O B O T I Q, that's building a prototype, uh, very cool car that runs very similar. You can rent it out, it's all uh, blockchain ready, so you can do it over the Ethereum blockchain. Uh, really, really neat stuff that's happening. And, and when we say renting out, we're looking at the future of you go to work and you're Tesla or other self-driving car, and you say that I'll allow this car to work for four hours, and the car is going to drive and pick up passengers and drop them off, fully autonomous, recharge come, itself, come back to the parking lot, recharge itself, you go, you go home. You you like made money twice, or you at least paid for the car while while Yo. it was paying for itself. Yeah. Yo, dog, I heard you like making money. <laughs> <laughs> Buy this car. So yeah. You, you, so, you, so you can make money while you make money. <laughs> That's a good idea. I like it. Well, excellent. And so there's there's a lot going on. I mean, Ethereum. It, it's like the, what what I take away from this episode right here. Uh, let's see. In a, in a nutshell, TLDR: Federal Reserve is not doing well. U.S. debt not doing well. Bitcoin not doing well. Ethereum <laughs> doing well. Dash doing Dash well. Doing Dash well. doing well. And that's another big thing yep. we didn't really talk about they, much. They uh, released uh, twelve point one recently, and. Uh, the network's kind of in limbo between the old and the new, but uh, 12.0 and 12.1. But uh, people are certainly hopeful that it's going to bring in so, a lot of uh, changes and, and there are some uh, ad- <clears throat> additional features that uh, Dash is looking to bring in that uh, that uh, Bitcoin is not thinking of. Yeah, and not not only that, but as as I've mentioned before and, and, and something... Like not trying to sell Dash because you know I, I think it's better than anything else, but just because I like to talk about how they have their own governance, you know, their own their own ability to make decisions with their their sort of their own decentralized autonomous organization. They have a, a, di- a multitude of different ways of handling transactions with master nodes and then the, the standard blockchain, and then they have a, a, a multitude of different ways to mine them between proof of stake and and traditional mining. And and um, it's I think the fact that they're they're not beholden to any one way I think makes them more adaptable and more capable in the long term. Resilient. Yeah, and that, and it's a great test bed for all of these new technologies. I mean, I really believe uh, I, I've been in computers since I was a kid. Always interested me, and I think that blockchain technology is is the cutting edge, most exciting development in computers since the internet. And and you manage computer systems like you you manage desktops and and networks and things like that. And what what do you see like from your perspective? How could blockchains make your job easier? So I actually work in IT in the financial industry. So I see the potential of these um, these initiatives to get uh, old legacy ways of uh, confirming balances and stock trades and and other types of financial instruments. To get it on a on a blockchain, even if it's private, it's just far more efficient. You can have uh, less in the data center. Uh, money saved there could be invested in other areas. Maybe you know machine learning to help you know do better financial decisions. So it it can free up money for financial companies to be more innovative. And we we were talking about that that whole uh, paying a toll thing. Now now imagine and this and this idea just came to me but imagine the same thing is applied to you like you you have your employee badges you're walking through and you want to have a, you know a very secure place and every door has one of those toll like monitors and every door is locked 
And every time you walk up to the door, a little you know micro transaction happens on the private blockchain that that hashes and time date stamp and like security authorization, and the door unlocks as the by the time you touch the handle, and like it just tracks everything where yeah, it, it security know, wise, right? It knows who went in the data center, who touched what equipment. Uh, should something have gone wrong, they know who to reach out to. Exactly. Absolutely. Yeah, I think in that and and not only that, but then you don't punch a clock anymore. Now you go on break. You know what I'm saying? It just automatically knows you've left your desk or you've left your, your work area. And in, in, in fact, it knows you've, you've entered the cafeteria. Right. And, and because you've left your desk, maybe that call gets routed to your coworker that hasn't. Exactly. I mean, there's so much potential for efficiency. That was one of the things that uh, Vitalik talks about in his blog post. Uh, they're, one of the key focuses of the work they've been doing recently, he says, has been on this notion of, quote, protocol armor, um, which he says can turn many classes of traditional Byzantine fault-tolerant consensus algorithms into, quote, attributable fault consensus algorithms. So uh, if there's ever a protocol failure, not only do you know that there's like a number, whatever large number of validators were faulty, but you can also find out whom to blame. So they're trying to look at... at ways to show that when when things fail to be able to figure out exactly where and how and why and who um so that's yeah. transparency right yeah yeah i mean that's 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 important stuff there well it just a reminder you can tune in to neo cash radio every wednesday night don't want to miss a single mode of awesome neo cash content including special episodes and bonus interviews subscribe to our podcast in google play music itunes soundcloud stitcher iheart radio youtube podcast addict lbry and more and uh pedro once again thank you so much for joining us we really appreciate having you in the studio thank you it's always a pleasure to be here Excellent. So this is JJ, Darren, and Randy for Neo Cash Radio, where we discuss the future of money today. As always, you can check out our blog at neocashradio.com for show notes and links to all of these articles and more. Neo Cash Radio, where you, you should probably retweet all the things, right, Darren? That's so, right. Retweet all the things. Neo Cash Radio.